the ads business, we released 1,400 products, in addition to everything that was already in AdWords. Imagine rolling that out to your salespeople, getting them trained on it, to understand it, to sell it to your customers effectively, the customer to absorb that effectively, build a strategy and a solution against it, and then make the purchases. That was so difficult for us. So it included search, display, mobile, mobile search, mobile display, brand, performance, video, like every slice and dice that you could possibly think of that AdWords can do. And then a layer on top of that, the last five years or so, ad tech was on the rise. So ad exchanges, ad serving, supply side, buy side, like there was just so much technical stuff and multi-screen and tracking and app install, right? So as a product specialist group, we're training the salespeople every quarter, and we had to put together sales, strat uh, sales training plans with narratives and tell them, this is how you talk about it this year, and you've got to reach the customer at the right moment, and every year or two, we have different narrative to cut because of the changing patterns of, of behavior. So all of that, to me, was like massive scale, and I learned a lot from that. Um, even, but pivoting, pivoting, we did much more, of course, in the startup than, than in the large companies, although I will say... Danny knows this all too well. Every 18 months or so at Google, we reorged. So we re reorganized the structure of the company. And for my organization, Danny was also in before, uh, that's about 2,500 people just in North America, but we did it worldwide. That's about 10,000 people in the ad sales, strategy, uh, sales team. So imagine 10,000 people's jobs changing all of a sudden. Your building changes, your desk changes, your description changes, the product specialists become they called something else, and this thing is called all the documentation that you formed to create the first org, now you have to redo all of that for the next part. Like it's complex. But it's like a tectonic shift. Like our CBO at the time, our chief business officer, uh, Nikesh, I think it was it was pretty intelligent for Google to do this internally because we have people coming in all the time and we have people going out all the time. So if we have people going out to all of our competitors or to other companies, they know exactly how we operate. But if every 18 months we completely change how we operate, it's pretty strategic to do that, right? It also kept us internally on our toes because you couldn't ever rest on your laurels. You couldn't say, oh, I've been at Google seven years and pretty much got it down, I don't even have to think about it anymore. It was never a day like that. Every day was a challenge and every day was like something new, something different, what should we change, how should we say this to customers. If the, we weren't reaching our KPIs, we completely changed our narratives and our, and our product rollouts. So for a long time, we were selling products because there was search first, and then we added products in our ad strategy later. But then we started changing all of that to selling solutions. So to roll back, to sell our salespeople, don't sell products because the customers don't like you pitching 30 minutes of every product for the whole day when you're, when you're meeting with them. Instead, they want a solution to address their marketing objective, and that's what we do now until today. Addressing marketing objectives like, I'm trying to generate leads, or I'm trying to generate sales. That's their objective, that's what the CMO down, down cares about. So, to generate leads, this is what you should do, and I should have an entire package, the solution of products to generate leads, right? Instead of kind of one by one. But I'll say in startups that, um, when to realize that you should pivot, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, you should fire bullets before you fire cannons. Has anyone heard that expression? So imagine in the old days when two pirate ships are, are going to war or two countries are going to war in the sea. Um, it's dark at night. You can't tell where the other boat is. And you, you know, it's a long trek. It takes you weeks to get there. And your boat capacity is pretty limited. So you have all these cannons and everything and gunpowder and stuff that you carry along with you. But you don't want to waste them without knowing exactly where the target is. So uh, the saying is to fire bullets first. So take you know, a gun or whatever, like a little thing that you can throw, and see if it hits. If, you, if it goes and goes in the water, you know you missed. Fire, 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 ding! Okay, I got it. Set the cannon on the right track, fire cannons. Same thing in a, in a startup. If you fire cannons too early, you'll sink your ship you'll basically run out of any ammunition that you have. So you want to test things, test, 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 iterate, until you find something that is actually catching on, and then you put your resources against it. Um, and I really like that, that way of thinking about uh, when you're in a startup, whether to pivot or not. So pivoting means like you kind of put everything in one direction and you need to kind of change direction, 
Um, I think even earlier than that, you can determine how to get on the right path and calibrate. We'll do two more questions and then we'll open the floor. So one is, do you think that startups in the Middle East are truly original or are we all still trying to catch up with the trends? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have the sensor already. Um, so there's two types of companies that are happening. There's one which is, you see an outside global success and you localize it to the market here. The other one is that you have a technology or an innovation born here which actually has a global audience, right? So everyone's nodding their head. But it's pretty obvious. I think Chris Roeder wrote pretty much the same thing. He articulates a lot better than I do. He wrote something similar in his books, um, Startup Rising. But, but it's true. And so in some sense, the kind that are localizing an outside success and localizing it to here might be looked at as copycat, you know, rocket internet style company. But in fact, it's actually hard to, to localize to the Middle East and not just the language to Arabic, which alone is an issue. My wife was the, she launched Flipboard. Do anyone know what Flipboard is? She launched Flipboard in Arabic. So she had to curate content, which number one was hard to find beautiful content, not just the RSS feed part, the technical part, but content that had a nice story written well with some beautiful imagery that you can actually show on Flipboard because it's a visual, visual magazine. Um, and the second problem she had is she was constantly talking to the engineering team saying, the letters aren't rendering properly. Like, the Arabic letters aren't rendering properly in the app. Um, so that's just the Arabic part of it, and that's not what I mean. I mean, Rocket, Amazon, anyone who wanted to move in here could probably figure that part out, right? But the, the more nuanced part of it is when I'm gonna be a ride-sharing company and Kareem figuring out that they can do uh, book a ride now or book a ride later. No other ride-sharing company around the world was doing book a ride later. But with the traffic conditions and the lack of Sorry, it's on our part. Uh, Google Maps traffic data in the region. It's hard to estimate the ETA. So it says it would be there in two minutes. It takes like half an hour to get there. So when I started learning that, and as I was using Uber, and I'm a big fan of Uber as well, but I used Kareem a lot in the Middle East because I could set it for tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. and I know the car is going to be there. So it's a guarantee. With e-commerce sites, the localization took a form of cash on delivery. If you told a U.S. company that you're gonna be an online e-commerce site, but you take cash on delivery, people would think it's a joke. Like, the whole point of e-commerce is we don't have to do that anymore. But in the Middle East, you still had to do that, right? And that's how, you have to do whatever it takes to get it to fit the culture. So I think as long as there's a nuanced culture, and of course it's different per country as well. Like I said, it's not homogeneous across MENA, MENA which is another issue, right? <laughs> like, so there's just layers and layers of nuance around the localization effort. So it's very hard, and delivery, like you can't do Amazon second day delivery here, right? But there are companies within the region that are kind of figuring that out. Um, so I think those kinds of companies that are localizing outside efforts are good. We should continue to do them. They're necessary for the region. But those are gonna be the short-term kind of uh, the enlightening of a, the ecosystem here. Those will be the short-term part of it. I think the long-term part of it are gonna be when we have innovations born here, IP and technology that's born here that the whole world uses. So Hint Hubaika was a Lebanese entrepreneur. She, she created the first smart swimming goggles, like a Fitbit for swimming, right, ever. And she, has, she got great investment now, and she has a worldwide audience. There's no reason that that's limited to Mina, right? And there's several examples of that, and, and that's what I've, I'm very excited about for the future. And lastly, what's the one piece of advice you would give to all of the entrepreneurs in the room? Or rather, what's the one piece of advice you would give to your younger self when you started your first startup? Um, yeah, so kind of... Yeah, the, be careful of, of the legal stuff, uh, for sure. Um, but I think we have, uh, especially in, in the Gulf and in Dubai, a tendency to have a couple of cultural things that are not startup culture, and that is, one of them is that you're a boss and you have employees and they do all the work. In startup culture, you do all the work, right? Of course you hire great people and, and hopefully the thing will scale. But the other thing is that, um, that you wanna give your employees equity in the company so that you can create an ecosystem of everybody doing well if the company does well, and you can motivate them that way. Um, we'll, Oh, the advice I'd give myself. Uh, I, 
I leaned on sort of the opposite of the advice I would give you, which is I bootstrapped too many startups. I should have raised money. I had the experience, and I, I just you know intimidated to go ask somebody for money when I didn't have you know it just felt weird to me. Uh, early days. Now I, I'm totally comfortable with it. But I think here we take money and spend money uh, a lot easier than we do do the gritty uh, roll up your sleeves. You know, till you have no drops of blood left, and then go ask for money. So there's a little bit of sort of two ends of the spectrum. I was on the end of the spectrum where I did that, and I should have actually asked for money. I could have scaled a lot faster. So I was like, I was running lifestyle businesses when I should have been running venture businesses. Here, I feel like, and it's because I talk to people, I'm not just assuming. Um, they raise a lot of money, they spend a lot of money, uh, or they spend somebody else's money, or they hire a consultant to do the work for the startup. Like, come on. Like somebody, a question we had earlier was, if we, before we fund, uh, before we raise money in funding, should we hire McKinsey to create our pitch deck? I was like, if you can afford McKinsey, you don't need to raise money. Like, just ridiculous to me. Um, but I think uh, the most important thing is to keep your head down and, and, and be resourceful as much as you can. You raise money when you need to raise money. Um, but you have to be 90% of the way there before an investor will invest in you. So kind of another point on that is like, I've seen a lot of people here say they have a full-time job and they have two startups and they are asking me for advice. It's very upsetting to like, you know, you're like focus 100% on your thing before you ask other people to help you on that thing. Like you're putting 50%, you want me to put the other 50% of time, you know? Or you walk into an investor's office and you didn't do a home, your homework on who that investor is, what their portfolio is, what they invest in, and you're pitching them a totally different idea, like, that will piss them off, you know, that, that you didn't even do your, your work. So quit your day job and be prepared. <laughs> okay, uh, questions, comments, experiences, uh, from the back, if you would like to share. Yes? Thanks so much for sharing your story. Uh, you mentioned early days for a startup, how did you balance the time management playing with the undergrad student in UCLA with the startup? And how did you find energy to push through all that at the same time as a young person? So the question was, how did I balance uh, my first startup idea out of college? Um, I took several quarters off to do my startup. <laughs> my, my parents weren't happy about that, but they didn't know very much, so I kind of used my tuition for that quarter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can an idea be too complex to start? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the sense that you want to tackle a big problem in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of features and bells and whistles, sure, you can definitely distill that down to something simple to start with. We see that a lot. Okay. I've definitely been through that a lot. Um, and I like coaches and stuff who kind of come to me and say, well, boil that down. Boil that down. Boil that down. What can you build in six weeks first? And what problem will it solve? And then kind of grow from there. Um, Danny. What, what advantages do you think startups in the region have? Yeah, I think startups in the region have a lot of advantages. So number one is arguably you have access to talent that's a lot cheaper than, than Silicon Valley. Um, you also have the advantage of you didn't have to go through the same phases, let's say desktop, laptop, mobile phone. Right? You're already at mobile phone. It just skips generations of technology. And that's the beauty of internet access. So once everybody has access here, you are at the forefront just like anybody in Silicon Valley or Japan or Korea or China or UK have. So you have the same resources that they have. Um, so to me, you're, you're all of a sudden just as competitive as they are in that regard. Yeah, so the question was, how is it important to have co-founders or a team versus yourself? Um, from, a VC's from a VC's perspective? So from a VC's perspective, they'd like to see multiple co-founders because it, it means you know how to work with other people. 
which ends up being the biggest problem of the startup, that everything else being equal and everything else being fine, the only problems usually that end up in, in a growing company are people problems. 